Hello and welcome to the History Tea Podcast, the podcast with lots of history and, of course, lots of tea. Hey, David. Hey, Ali. You all right? I'm good, sir. Good. Have you got your cup of tea? Oh, it wouldn't be a history tea podcast without a good cup of tea, David. And it is a good cup of tea, I will say. I will say. Right, well, oh, I've, got a, I've got a, well, a surprise for you, Ali. Oh. We're going to be talking about history. Uh, so obviously, obviously, that's not the surprise. It's just a build up. Um, and we're going to be doing something a bit more topical than usual. I thought, you know, a bit, bit zeitgeisty. Go, Go on. Get on the trend, right? I'm talking PPI. <laughs> I'm talking personal protection. I'm talking the history of armour in all its shapes and forms. Brilliant. You know, just a brief one. It's quite a lot of stuff to talk about. Did we can they, just like gather. Did they suffer with COVID back in the 1400s? But they, well, not COVID. They mm. probably suffered with a lot worse. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Spanish flu. That was Spanish flu. But that was, yeah, that was a few years back. And then you had the plague. That was pretty rough as well. Um, but I think I'm going to be talking more about like personal protection against swords, axes, bows, guns, that sort of stuff. Sick. Mm-hmm. I'm all about that. Yeah, it's pretty good shit. But where to start, I suppose, is wild. Because like we've had armor. For as long as like, we've had weapons, we've been trying to have armor. So like furs and leathers and bits and bats. Mm. But like, should we start with like the beginning of metal armor? Oh, I don't know. I... I know they used like pig skin and stuff, didn't they? His armor. Yeah, they did. In the early days. They did. So like, let's say, like when it comes to like leather armors, there's a thing called queer bully. It's French, probably butchered the name. Right. But basically it's like a boiled leather armor that can also be just as strong as metal in certain circumstances. Mm, mm. What do you mean strong? Like penetrative strong? Yeah, like genuinely, you get, they like uh, saw sort of 13th century knights, we think a lot of the depictions that we see that we might have misinterpreted as metal plates were actually this queer bully, this leather plateage. So you sort of layer the leather up on top of each other, boil it to make it hard. And then there is some, there is some, because queer bully I think translates to boiled or mm-hmm. something like that. And there is some recent developments in, in this sort of research about how like, cause boiled leather is tough, but it's not necessarily the toughest thing. It can be quite brittle. Uh, it doesn't wear very well, um, which contradicts kind of how the people reported it at the time, how effective it was. So they're also talking about how they might have treated it with certain like resins and like natural glues that they were developing and uh, sort of really sort of make these things like rock hard and really, really tough, like tough enough to stop an arrow or tough enough to stop uh, a sword. Yeah, obviously, it's not as good as metal. If it was as good as metal, they wouldn't have made the metal ones because it's much easier to make the leather stuff. I was going to say, yeah. But so. it's, it's it's incredibly tough. It probably just didn't last as long. You know, you probably went into a couple of battles and it like got worn down and you'd have to replace it. Mm. But that's like another type of armor, like the gambeson, padded gambeson. Is it, yeah, I was going to say, is it quite... Cause, Even though it's quite tough, it must be a bitch to make. Was it harder than mining for ore and all that sort of stuff? Uh, I don't know. Like the processes um, of tanning leather and stuff would have been pretty commonplace. It would have been cheaper, much cheaper. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that the Egyptians, while they came into contact with like metal prior to the modern processes of mining for ore and getting the metal out that way, is like meteorites, like genuinely, like meteorites like crash nearby. And then we're able to just like utilize that a bit better. Yeah. And aliens built the pyramids. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying. What I, <laughs> I don't know. I cannot confirm or deny that. I have not <clears throat> heard that or read anything about that. But yeah. I mean, we've been using like metal for a long, long time. Cause like, well, I'm talking 1300s for this queer bully stuff. Right. Um, but before that, you know, you got to look at like ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. Bronze, mate. Ooh, bronze. They loved their bronze. Their bronze was sick. Their bronze was like the top dog of armors and metals and stuff. Problem is, bronze is soft as shit. Mm. So it's, it was good against other bronze things, but it 
doesn't wear very well. It dents well easy, you know. I was going to say bronze would not be my first choice. No, but it was the it was like it's an easy metal to work. That's why they used it because like you could literally just like cast bronze things. Whilst with later when you're looking at steel, you have to like forge it and beat it. Like, but like a like I know we're talking about armor, but like a bronze sword, you could just like you know dead bronze swords. Yeah, bronze swords, bronze axes. But the thing about the construction of those weapons is that they were very short and stubby to reduce the amount of bend and flex that you get in them. But like famously, like there's lots of accounts and, and actual images of like Greek soldiers bending their swords back into line halfway through a battle because they hit something. And can dead. you mix the two? Like, can you have like a, I don't know, like a structural support rod in terms of like steel or something. And then on the outside, you have bronze. You could. And that's kind of how they designed some of the weapons, uh, the swords especially. I mean, I'm they sorry. They had like a very solid, they had a much more, so... Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. Yeah. And depend, depending on the percentages of that depends on the properties of the bronze. So if you, I think if you up the copper, it's softer. And if you up the tin, it gets harder. So they probably had a high, higher tin core. And then they would have a, a, a sort of, a, sort of, yeah. Um, no, sorry, a softer core to give it flex. And then a harder edge. And that's how the Chinese did it. And the, the Europeans and the Greeks and stuff, they just cast it as a solid piece. Um, but the Chinese actually developed They're it in like, much, <coughs> yeah, much they, better they ways. Yeah, they did what they do best. Yeah. Um, they would have like shelves and uh, built into the blade and stuff. But I'm digressing. We're not on armor anymore. We're on swords. Back to armor. But yeah, they <laughs> use bronze. They use bronze. It's why you get like all the Greek stuff as well. It's quite ornately designed and shapes to the body image right. is because it's, again, it's quite easy to work. And so you can get quite arty farty with it. And we do see stuff like that coming in. Uh, later in the steel armor era, um, but they took a lot longer to get there, and it took a higher level of skill and, and time to do. But yeah, so bronze was a big, big deal back in ancient Greece and uh, other ancient cultures. Um, it's a weird one because like you got bronze, right, and that looks pretty high tech. But then the Romans come along and they start to really sort of develop iron and steel, um, and uh, which you know everyone. Like, gives it to the Romans, like the Romans made it and stuff. Nah, 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 nah. It was the Celts, mate. It was the Europeans that were developing that kind of technology. Um, even though we think, you know, they lived in like huts made out of shit, which <laughs> they absolutely did live in huts made out of shit. Um, but they were fucking shit hot at working metal because there's quite a high percentage of like ores and stuff in, in Europe. Um, so there was something they came across quite often and worked with a lot. But yeah, so like chain mail, it was the Celts that made that. The Romans adopted it because it was so fucking good. Uh, chainmail. You know what chainmail is. Yes. I mean, I believe there's two different types of chainmail, David. Oh, you've been listening to me too much. Oh, I have, David. You know what? It's rubbed off on me. Um, I don't know what the technical term is. I'm going to call it chainmail one and chainmail two. All right. Describe to me chainmail one. Okay. Chainmail one is more for show they're not that the links between them aren't uh particularly strong they're not welded or something or they're not like pressed together whereas chainmail 2 is a lot stronger and used for more um for going into battle because the the links are fused almost is that right i don't know <laughs> More or less. Yeah, so yeah. chainmail one. Chainmail one is what I would you refer to as butted mail. And that is where they I was going to say that. Um, typically, you have uh, rounded rings rather than flatted rings, um, which is hard to sort of imagine. But like, imagine like the difference between a donut and a frisbee with a hole in the middle. So the flat rings, so that the, the ring is flat whilst the it's like whilst the other one, the rounded rings are kind of they're both round obviously, but they're more like a wire rather than a uh So it's like you've taken it and you've put it in like a press and you've like yeah. flattened it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's two types of that that sort of ringage out there. Um but typically butted will be the first type, so more 3D. <laughs> <laughs> they're both 3D, David. I know they're both 3D, but I'm really hard like it's hard to describe without actually showing. Um and that the butted nature of it is where basically they have just bent the ring to close it off. Mm. So obviously 
quite weak. You can, if you hit it with any force, it can cause the rings to open up a bit like a key ring that's gone a bit fucking shit. And uh, and then the rings fall apart and the mail can start to fall to pieces. Um, it's not what you want. Not ideal in a battle situation, but, you know, and then people did take those things into battle because they, again, they did not They did a good enough job. They just might not last that long. Um, but they were cheaper and quicker to manufacture. That was mm. like the best thing about them. Whilst Chainmail 2 is what we call riveted Chainmail. And so, yeah, it's not welded together because obviously it didn't... Hey, they, I was, they, I was, they I was saying it, I was like, well, they couldn't weld at that point, but I didn't know the... The, te- the official terminology for yeah. it, actually, David. So, That's all right. It's all right. You know, this is a le- I feel like this is as much a learning podcast as it is taking the piss out of me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that stuff, uh, again, typically, especially in sort of the sort of high medieval period, was flat rings. Right. And then you would basically bind them over the top of each other and you'd stick a metal rivet through each ring to bind it together. So that was a much stronger connection and would so last So there's an actual longer. secondary piece connecting them together? No, no, no. So what you do is at the end of the ring, you kind of flatten it out um, to then slide over the top of one another and put a rivet through the two. So a rivet is like basically a very small pin of metal, which you... Walk. I know what a rivet is. There you go. Titanic had loads of them. Yeah, well, they didn't work, did they? No. Yeah. Um, but that's what I mean. So there's a... So obviously you got your rings. Yeah. And they uh, just shove another... So that's what I mean. There's a second bit to it, essentially. Yeah, you basically... So if you got your rings, you just put a rivet through, right? Because they overlap slightly. You put the rivet through that bit of the ring. Right, okay. So you bump. Yeah. And then that holds that together. And so that was much stronger, but obviously took way longer to make. I was going to say, that sounds... Fucking effort. Yeah, it's a ball lake, mate. Mail is a ball lake. Like, people think, like, mail was for the poor. And it does become for the poor later, or the poorer, later down the line you go. Because the processes get easier to make. And people get better at it. Like everything. TVs. TVs, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nowadays, you buy Everyone's them. got one. Everyone's got one. And they've all got a big flat screen. Yeah. More or less. But yeah. So, like the TV, it does get more accessible. But at first, it's a massive ball lake. You know, we've got like, not factories, factories is the wrong word, but you had like workshops where people would- I can would imagine make... you paid for someone's excellency in making. Absolutely. I can imagine the king or royalty of any type had. Typically- Had like a, a pro chain mail maker. Yeah, absolutely. Most countries, especially in the medieval period, had their own sort of sanctioned arms workshops, which would come with like an official stamp to say like this was made in England or this was made in Germany or whatever. <clears throat> you wouldn't want that stamp now, would you? No, you Anything wouldn't. made in England? Oh, oh shit. It. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Well, it's going to sound fire in about three minutes. But no, Chainmail took forever to make. Like, and basically they were made by, you had basically teams of people. Um, so you had the guy that smiths them or uh, forges them and they're, they're really, basically they cast them in separate little like things so you can do it a load at a time. Mm. And then you'd give these individual rings to people uh, at desks or not desks, stand up desks, good for the backs. Um, they were very like concerned about their workers' environment. Uh, no, I don't know. They were they're <laughs> probably a table of some description and they would basically make little squares in the mail and then they would pile the squares up and then the person at the end of it would then turn it into the, the shirt as we know. And um, that covered the whole body and well, covered whatever part of the body that was required. Because um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Like the Normans, big on their cavalry, they had basically head to toe chainmail. So you had chainmail halberks, which went from like your neck all the way down to your wrists, all the way down to your knees. And then underneath that, they would have chainmail uh, stockings, which were tied with garters or with a belt around the waist. And you had chainmail mittens. Like, you know, the little <laughs> ones you get as a kid. No You way. know, with the strings on them to keep them to your sleeves. And chainmail mittens. Um, usually, Surely that's just a bit annoying, though. I guess if you're just holding a sword, you ain't. You yeah, know, well, on the inside, they typically had a leather padding oh, or nice. leather sort of, or, or like a, something to give it a little bit more grip. Um, and often they had um, the ability to slide the mitten off, but still attach to the wrist. Okay. So that they could have more dexterity if required. You know, you wouldn't want to like be like, oh, sign this. Oh, I need to send a quick text. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, I can't do it with me chain mail. Bloody on. mittens. Fucking. Fuck you, you know. 
how will my mum know I'm safe? I didn't give her three rings on the battlefield. I didn't. I didn't text her that I got back from England after <laughs> invading. <laughs> cool, so chain mail. So <clears throat> chain mail. And then, so why did they move away from chain? Do they have anything else on top of the chain mail? They must have, because I've seen them. They, you know, they have the under, the chain mail under, and then they have all the big bulky bits of metal. Yeah, well. But did they come around at the same time? Or was that more of a... Basically, mail sticks around for a long, long time. In fact, mail sticks around until World War I in certain areas. Um, technically, mail's still around today for people that dive with sharks and fishmongers who wear mail gloves to stop them cutting their hands off. Like, So mail's never really gone away. It's such a bloody good bit of technology and it's so well done that it's sort of always had a place. Mm. Um, but it's not like perfect. You know, for instance... What's it made of? A bunch of rings. What's the defining feature of a ring? A fucking hole. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a shit ton of holes all over you. Um, so pointy things like spears, arrows, uh, anything that with a fine tip could often get inside the ring uh, and bust it open or possibly, you know, to go through it and straight into you. Um, the second downfall of mail is that uh, it's really flexible. Which is great because you can move around in it and that's shit hot. Like you don't want to be stuck in like a rigid bit of metal because you would be shit. But you would uh, ultimately, uh, if you got hit by something, it doesn't stop the impact. So it will stop the sword cutting through you, but you have a fucking well bruised arm or a broken bone underneath it. Oh, yeah. Which is why mail was almost always accompanied with some form of padding underneath the mail. And we would typically call this a gambeson or a padded jacket because we're well imaginative, these historians. And sometimes the gambeson, right? Good enough as it, as it is, don't even need mail. Like joking aside, like basically what it is, is typically linen that's stacked up on top of one another and pressed and compacted. And then you sew, you do like a quilted pattern over it to sort of make it stronger and more rigid. A, a quilted throw. A, yeah, a quilted throw. Exactly. Lovely. Lovely. Sounds nice. Yeah, but it's really fucking tough. Sleep in it. It'll stop. If it's made de decently enough, it stops swords, like, cutting through you. Um, you wouldn't want to have the maker have a bad day, would you? Like, no, you wouldn't. Oh, just you woken wouldn't. up on a Monday is a bit, oh, fucking... Can't be asked. I'll only put one layer in. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so that stuff's really strong. Um, even sometimes stopping arrows, uh, which is no mean feat. Like, they're well hard to stop. They're proper sharp. Notorious. And, like, yeah. Mm. And Sharp. they use them. They use them a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes they're even good enough to do stuff like that. So if you didn't have much money, money, Muller, Wonga, then uh, you get yourself a gambeson and that'd be a good way of keeping yourself alive. And again, that sort of technology we think goes back a lot further than we have any records of because basically the problem with that sort of stuff is that there's no archaeological evidence because they don't they last. I was going to, yeah. They just yeah. rot. So the, the few examples we have come from like, church collections and things like that and aren't too old but i imagine for as long as people had that my voice is gone <clears throat> yeah, click, <clears throat> clear, clear your throat there we go ah uh. so so we imagine that's been used for a lot longer than like we've got recorded um but you know it's hard to tell it's all just hearsay after that point but yeah so that's 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 what they wear under mail typically and then as people get better at working with metal they manage to develop what we know as plate armor. Well, actually, I skipped one. There's a thing called a brigadine. That's pretty sick. Brigadines are kind of like the in between between plate <laughs> and mail, I suppose. So, like, basically, making a plate of metal that's strong enough to withstand an impact is well hard. It's really difficult. You need really good quality metal, which is more accessible as people get better at finding the stuff. So whilst they can't make these huge sheets of metal that we see in the late medieval period, they basically just make little metal strands and then they just sew them together uh, in a jacket mm. um, and make a big sort of like, yeah, sort of a gilet of steel. Um, oh, wow. And then you cover the top of that with leather, um, rivet it, or leather, velvet, or whatever you want to cover it in to make it like look fancy and pantsy. And then you basically got yourself a, a, an armor jacket, which again, not as good as plate, but it's fucking solid. Like it's going to do you, do you so solid. You could, you could go to the pub in that. I wouldn't go in the pub in that. It's a bit uncomfortable, bit heavy. Yeah, but you know, if if it looks like a normal jacket. 
Oh, it don't look like a normal jacket. Does it not? No, it looks oh, like... Oh, I just assumed it was like, you know, like 007. Like no. Like suit jacket's lined with like no, bullet you... stopping material. <laughs> if you imagine a regular armour, like medieval armour, and then just imagine it looking... It kind of looks like a regular breastplate to a certain degree on the front. Right. Because you can't see the articulated plates because they're covered by the material. Mm. But on the inside, it's like a bunch of articulated plates. But again, that was like kind of like rich man's armor before plate was a big thing and then slowly became more accessible to lower echelons of society and became more of a soldier's armor towards the end of the medieval period. So that's another step in the right direction. There's also another armor which typically wasn't used in Europe and that's called scale armor. And it's fairly similar. You make loads of little like scales uh, and you sew them into a jacket um, and it looks a bit like a dragon. Right. Which is kind of sick. Um, and it's kind of similar in chainmail in its sort of effectiveness. Like uh, it's got loads of little plates. It's kind of, obviously there's gaps and stuff that things can get into. But again, really solid bit of kit. Typically used more towards the, like East, East, the Eastern world. So like China, Mongol, uh, even like Eastern Russia and the Rus and stuff like that. They were all, uh, all kind of wearing that sort of gear. But yeah, um, so that's that. And then you get into plate. In Europe, at least, and plates like a solid fucking piece of shit. It's well good, and that's like when you think of like when you think of like your knight, that's your typical knight, right? Yeah, that's why that, my when someone says knight in in my head, I think of chainmail followed by bulky bits of metal armor. Yeah, on top, and that's kind of the height of armor. Like I'd argue, like that is like as good as it gets. Because not you got you got your plate on the top, and your plate is solid against everything, right? It's solid against pointy things, sharp things, ebby things, right? It's really really good at protecting you. Underneath that, you'd have mail, just to cover the bits that you can't quite cover in plate. And then underneath that, you probably have a, a what they called an arming jacket at that point, which was padded jacket, partly for defence, mainly for comfort. I'm not gonna lie. Like after wearing it, you do not want to be wearing it without. <laughs> without that I, I tell you what like when you see like the romantics or like medieval tales where the knight picks up the princess and like whisks her away she's getting pinched in all sorts of places that is an unpleasant experience <laughs> she's bruised she's bruised she's, <laughs> she's, she's having a bad time thank god she's unconscious from that spell right <laughs> but anyway so that's that and, but I always also, wondered that about bloody uh, delving off here go but um uh, Disney's bloody Sleeping Beauty. Right, if her... Right, she's cast a spell onto this bloody... Or she's, you know, poisoned apple. Yep. That can only be broken but, by true love's care. If she... Her end goal is to kill her. Why don't she just use some regular ass fucking poison? Uh, do you know what? That's a really good question. I guess it'd make a shit story. Y yeah, but it doesn't make sense. I mean, if you really want to know the truth, like the original one, uh, the prince rapes her while she's sleeping. Yeah. And then she I've, gives birth to children. Di yeah, Disney. 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 Because <laughs> all these fairy tale stories, they they're are grim. They're grim. No, yeah. you know, joking aside. They're horrible. Yeah. But they somehow managed to turn. Is it. Like there's a level of fucked up you have to be to be able to take a story like that and go, you know what? I'm gonna we'll make, make it for kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the recent bloody Tangled film, right? Because the whole yeah, so she gets taken away, and every year there's lanterns that go up, and to signify, you know, um, the princesses, uh, she's been taken away, and they light these ca uh, like lanterns, and they send them up in the sky every year on her birthday, and. Uh, the princess clocks on, she's in a tower, she's looking, she's like, why does that happen on my birthday? And it makes her curious. What she should have done, the person that took her, is... Boarded at the windows? Like, <laughs> if she's born in capti captivity, she doesn't need to know birthdays exist. Do you know what I mean? That's why true. would she ever mention it? She's, ru she's ruined her whole plan. She doesn't even need to know. Like, why would you? Like, birthdays are just a... I don't know. I just think a bit too much. I mean, I love the films, but, you know, there's some gaping flaws in them. Yeah. Speaking of flaws. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> there's some gaping flaws in plate armour. Oh, yes. 
Because you see, plate armor is solid, like pretty much makes you indefens- uh, 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 indestructible on the old medieval battlefield. However, you can't put plate everywhere because you need to be able to move. So most armors... What about your crotch area? I can imagine that's one that you can't really... You can't really cover it because you're going to be riding a horse. You don't want mm. metal, ooh, the, the chafing, ooh. Well, yeah, your ass as well. I guess that whole yep. bottom area is... So limited. typically, what you have is like this metal skirt that comes off the breastplate and sits over the top of that area to give it protection. And then underneath that, you'll again have a male skirt that again will drop down to again offer some more protection. But the truth is, I reckon a lot of knights out there went out by getting hit in the cock with a sword or an axe or something oh, nasty. Well, you'd, you'd take an opportunity, wouldn't you? Yeah. Because the main targets you're going to be aiming for if a medieval knight comes charging well, He's at covered you. head to toe, head to apart toe. from his fucking apart dick. Apart from his dick. And his anus. So I'm going to knee slide past him, shove a fucking sword up his ass. Yep. Basically. So inside of the thighs often are exposed. Back of the legs often are exposed. And, back of the, and inside of the thighs, massive Arteries. fucking artery. Exactly. There. But it's compromised. If you've got chain mail, you would, you know, like you say, that offers a bit of protection against like slashing. Yeah. Yeah, it does to a certain degree, but it's it's a skirt. So if you get underneath the skirt, you can get in there. So you're going to be aiming for that area. You're going to be aiming for, depending on the type of armor and depending on the period, throat. Because again, it was very hard to allow someone to be able to move their head whilst covering that area mm. with plate. So throats were exposed for quite some time. They do develop other armors to defend against that. So uh, especially, uh, well... Both types of armors, the Italians and the Germans, developed it. But uh, you see it in a lot of German-styled armors. Uh, these things called gorgets. Um, funny enough, French word, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, these gorgets, which will basically cover your throat and the, your chin as well. So that that's something they do. But the back of the neck would be exposed still. Um, the Elizabethans then go on further and develop it even further where you've got these articulated plates that you can move your head around whilst using the armors. But it's, uh, yeah, anyway, digressing. And then other areas, armpits and inside of the arms. These are all the targets you're going to be looking at and trying to get to. Obviously, like eye slits as well, but they're well small, so I wouldn't. Until you've got him on the ground and you know you've got, like, the upper hand, I wouldn't bother going for something like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a small target. Very small target. Moving. Yeah. So yeah. this is why Iron Man, he had his slits covered. He did with light bulbs. I don't know how he saw. Oh, he had a screen on the inside, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. That's the next step, really, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Like, you, you, I guess nowadays you could have like an augmented reality on the inside of your helmet, like on a screen, and then you have the cameras on the outside, and that would work, I suppose. But, but yeah. But that, that's, that's, that's even dependent of whether we continue with that, because obviously armor's died out these days. They will, though, because the... They're always looking into like... It's coming back. Into bloody... Um, mech suits and mechs, shit. Yeah, like all the... Help you lift fucking heavy objects and all that sort of shit. And Exactly, coach. and that's the only... But then again, I doubt they will because it's too expensive. Too expensive. Like It's they, cheaper just to have a soldier die they, and replace them. Like, no offence to anyone that's, you know, served in the armed forces. You know incredible what you guys do because i wouldn't be able to fucking do it because i'm too much of a fucking wimp yeah i'm soft as shit but they ain't they ain't gonna spend you know tens of thousands for these mech suits on someone that's being paid 20 grand unless they prove to be the most effective way of dealing with an enemy they won't bother but they won't because the most effective way is to use an unmanned drone yeah this is it you just yeah you'd get an unmanned drone bomb the fuck out of it and then you guys go in there where it's all fucking done yeah, it's crazy. But again, digressing. Mm. So, where were we? Medieval armor. We got to the pinnacle of armor. Like now, at this point as well, you've got. Actually, can I remember all the names of the bits of the armor because they've all got funny names? So let's try and go through it. So for your head, you've got your helmet, obviously, but there's loads of different styles of helmets. Great that. helm. I know that one. There you go. Great helm. That was one that was yes, used. That was typically used in the 1300s uh, and a little bit into the 1400s. Then you had a bassinet, which came in all different configurations, but the most famous bassinet would be the one of the 1400s, early 1400s, which is the hound or the, the pig face bassinet or the dog face bassinet. And um, the one with like the real like pointy nose. Um, they didn't stick around long because they were shit. <laughs> Why were they shit? 
Well, they were fine at defending your face, which is all well and good, but people couldn't see out of them. <laughs> like, because the, the, the conical shape meant that the helmet sat so far away from your head, you, your peripheral vision was really poor. Obviously, your likelihood of getting an arrow in the face or a lance in the face was much, much super minimized um, because that cone did, missed, like, directed the energy elsewhere and also sort of acted a bit like a crumple zone if you do get struck too hard. Um, but yeah, trying to see out of the slits that were sitting so far away from your eyes became a real problem. So they actually God, that'd be horrible, off. wouldn't it? Yeah. They then briefly go into recreating the old sort of Greek helmets, which are known as Corinthian helmets, you know, the ones with like the T-shape. So you've got like the round head and then you've got like the T-shape. So it's got your eyes and your mouth open. So the medieval people called them bar boots, um, quite uh, popular in Italy at the time. Um, so that was a, a brief sort of stint of armor. Mm -hmm. um, and then they've got the uh, Salé and the Gorget combo. And the Salé uh, sits really close to the face. So the eye slits are really easy to see out of. Like this is a little experiment I always tell people to do, right? You get like your fingers and like just make a little gap in between two fingers. Right? I hope you're doing this at home. All right. And what you do. Don't do it while driving. Don't do it while driving. Please don't do it while driving. Uh, is close one eye and then look through the gaps and like just sort of see what you can see. And fuck it's not, all. it's fuck Sweet all. FA. Fuck all. It's really hard. But as you move it closer and closer and closer to the eye, suddenly you can almost see the whole room. And that's exactly how the Sale worked was that the gap itself was minimal, really slender, right? So it minimized any danger towards the eyes. But because it's so close to the face, it meant that you've got really good peripheral vision and you actually your, your visibility or vision was really, really. Well, good. I'll just repeat the same words three, four times then. That's fine. Basically, you could see, and that was sick. <laughs> but Seeing is cool. The Sally only covers half the face, and that's where the gorget comes in, which actually um, sits on the throat to protect the throat. And then you typically have like a solid chin guard, which is one piece with the throat piece, and then a, a sliding plate that you can slide up over the mouth and nose or back down. So you can breathe, talk, that sort of stuff. Um, most of these helmets. Iron Man, I'm telling you. Iron Man, yeah. And the Sale <laughs> top would have a visor as well. So you could lift the visor up to expose uh, your eyes so you could see better. There's even arguments that a lot of people fought with their visors up. Like they keep the visors down for the, the approach. So if any projectiles or missiles were coming in, they were protected. And then when they actually got into thick Tomahawk things. Tomahawk missiles coming in. <laughs> Shit. Visors down, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Dunk. Uh, but then when they got into thick of it, like obviously because they want to breathe and see better, they would lift the visor up and, and fight like that. But I don't know the validity uh, validity of that statement. To it's just sort of a lot of sort of theory crafting. And um, there's a lot of images I think that support that. But again, there's a lot of images that support the opposite, where they're fighting with visors down. Um, but yeah, so not pictures, obviously, like paintings and shit. No one there like snapping like. Yeah, but you can't be too careful with paintings, can you? Because, you know, they're, they're slightly warped. And yeah, they are artistic. And again, yeah. there's there's a lot of art, like arguments of how valid are paintings as a source of fact in history. But well, because, you know... You do the best of what you got, basically. So you fill in the gaps. Um, if you're a poor king, if you're a poor, I don't know, poor member of royal, and you got, you you know, but you still managed to have a painter come in and be like, yeah, can you paint me on, like, this fucking sick horse with, like, some sick armour, please? But you haven't got that. Yeah, no, I haven't. But I need a glow up for my Instagram page. Yeah. So all the princesses from around the kind of like yeah, Europe need, come and like. Yeah. I need to send this picture out, prove I've got loads of money. Yeah. And then when they come here, you know, money trap them. I literally have no doubt. No doubt that happens. Money trap them. Like, <laughs> if you're painting a king who has the ability to have your head lopped off at the slightest insult, you ain't going to paint a bad picture of him, are you? You're going to maybe erase that spot, fix that nose, make his eyes look beautiful. Give him a six pack. Give him a six pack. Uh, Although there was a point in time where being fat was considered better because you, you know, shown you had wealth. wealth. Yeah. yeah. I could eat poor people. Fuck you. Yeah, there is a certain degree of that um, amongst nobody. I guess you don't want to be too, you don't want to you be, be too fat. You don't want to be 400 pounds sitting yeah. in bed. You, like Henry someone, <laughs> someone's painting you with a crane over you trying to lift you out of the bed to put you on a fucking horse. Check this out, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> Like Henry VIII started off fit, slowly got worse. Yeah, but he like the famous picture of him is when he's a big fat fucker. When he was a kid, he was like just my proper like athletic like legendary man. Bit of a sport brat, but still like 
Yeah, but he had so many athlete. wives. I don't think he, you think in the end he realized, oh, you know what, I don't need to be fit to get girls anymore. I'm king. You don't when you're king. No. They literally throw them at you. Yeah. Yeah. Have this one. Don't like that one. Next. <laughs> Grim in it. But yeah. That's another cool thing about armor though, is when you look at armor, it gives you a really good idea of what the person looked like, their size, the height, their build. So it's like, it's a really good detail of that because armor was not like I can imagine one. for kings and things like that, you'd have... I keep mentioning kings because I don't know any other station <laughs> any other <laughs> in, in the hierarchy of medieval yeah. periods. So forgive me, um, but they'd keep them, wouldn't they? Probably. Yeah. Be like, oh, this was our late king Henry VIII's armor, as you can see here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Henry VIII actually starts up. I can being... imagine they'd be quite expensive pieces as well. Yeah, he, so he starts really up an, an armory, the Greenwich Armory for England to try and make our England a, a sort of a manufacturing point for armor in Europe. Um, and he commissioned some of the most wild fucking armors out there. And then he also the, uh, starts Then the Chinese armors. copied the uh, patents and uh, took over. <laughs> he actually made a sick suit of armor. Cause I was talking about earlier where you need chainmail to cover the bits with plate. Cause he can't, plate can't cover everything. Mm-hmm. Well, he went, he kind of had a, like an Elon Musk moment. And he was like, <laughs> I want plate armor that covers everything. And they were like, it can't be done. He's like, make it happen and they did <laughs> here's your fucking money yeah make it happen or i'll fucking kill you yeah and they made it they just the guys were just so fucking good at what they did they managed to make really fine articulated plates to cover inside of the arms because the i have seen thighs. some like yeah like so that plate within plate yeah so that comes um, in with the elizabethans again because they get better and better at crafting this shit they get better and better at making those articulated joints man. and again they look really hard to run around in but they are so well made that they just I can imagine this material has got like and you know industrial revolution all that sort of stuff they would have just like picked up one yeah i mean by the time they got the industrial revolution they stopped making armor pretty much but yeah, yeah. i know well there would be no need but i can imagine just towards that you know before that started to hit off, you'd probably have some pretty yeah. ingenious ways of Whilst, like, mass say producing armor and doing all that stuff. The sort of height stuff. of armor's life was probably in the late 1400s and it starts to slowly become less relevant from that point on. Definitely the finest crafted armors of all time would be made in the 1500s. And whilst armor was kind of fading as a necessity, a necessity on the battlefield thanks to firearms, for shows of status and wealth and tournaments and everything like that, some of these fucking armors are insane. I was going to say, j- j- jousting was that a thing, probably? Yeah, jousting, definitely, definitely. Yeah, thing, so, yeah. and you know, that would be done for, that'd be like, you know, the Olympics. That'd yeah, yeah, like, exactly. For, yeah, it was. You know, or like a football game or something like that, you know, that yeah. would be a, a staple, so. Yeah. Like, if you imagine, like, the film Knight's Tale. Yeah, now, how accurate is that? So... Knight's Tale, what Knight's Tale does essentially sort of modernizes how it gives you the feel of what it would have been like to be at a tournament using modern sensibilities, like by comparing it to like other sports, like football and stuff like that. So you've got the crowds, the songs and stuff like that, that kind of modernized, obviously like Queen and shit getting played. That's how I would have felt to be there. However, that fucking film, the armor is <laughs> guff as balls. <laughs> it's so guff. Like... You watch uh, Sir Ulrich Linkenstein charging down the tilt rail and you can pretty much see the bridge of his fucking nose and his eyebrows. Like, you do not want to gap that wide in your helmet because a lance will go clean through your fucking skull. Now, I can, I can, um, you know, imagine for film purposes, discrepancies. You want to know who's who the, through the different camera angles and stuff, probably. But to a degree, yeah, yeah. sure. But But to be fair, he was wearing all black. Like yeah, exactly. The, the he, armors were iconic enough to yeah. know which and, and bad guys in black. Heath Ledger had bloody Nike in, on his. Yeah, he did. I like that. That was a nice little touch. D- would they have done that? They would have done. Not well, Nike. Like, not, but, not like a signature. Yeah, you but, know, initial or a little logo maybe. Or yeah, armorers had their little stamps, so you'd know exactly which armory it came from. They that's, would that's stamp sick. whatever they made, so that you kind of knew where it came from. Um, which is it, yeah, that's a legit thing. That's fucking cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Count Adamar. Yeah, Rufus Sewell. Oh, he's such a good bad guy. Yeah, oh, he did The Illusionist as well, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. He also played a Nazi in that sort of Man in the High Castle. I asked, did you? I saw him in another film the other day. <laughs> it was very good, actually. But I can't remember, so we'll move on. Oh, yeah, his mate, Mark Addy. Who else was in this film? 
Paul Bettany. Yeah, he's yeah. He was Chaucer. Yeah, he was always very good for that. He was um, very good. Very he's a, good. He's also Vision and or Jarvis in uh, Avengers films. For anyone that doesn't know, he is. Um. And then but yeah, Night's Tale, very good film. Very fun film. I love it. Even as a history like nerd and all the problems with it, like historically, it's a f- brilliant film. It's a sick film. Go and watch it. It's, br- it's just great. And the horses had armor, did they? The horses did have armor, yeah. Um, again, depending on wealth and depending on uh, sort of, you know, if you're in a parade, you'd put these big honking bits of steel on them because you don't have to worry about speed or anything like that. If you're in a battle, you might choose to put something a bit lighter, like mail on them. But again, they would take these plate armors of four horses into battle as well. Um, I mean, that's the thing, like a horse, mate. It, it, you ever been next to one, you can see the size and power. If you imagine that armor charging at you, you just be like, fuck this, I'm off. Not a chance in hell. Not for me. Not for me. But no, so... And all the, like, the flare, like the sort of... Do you have your basic armor... It's just, you know, just like your chest plate, yeah. your arms and stuff. And I've seen stuff where it's like, or seen armors where it's, you know, they've got what looks like a radio dish attached uh, on the chest. Right, or, okay. you know, they've okay. got like flares coming out of, you know, big old like um, shoulder uh, bits that yeah. are like, you know, quite wide. And, and now I assume that's for like deflecting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff. Absolutely. Typically, your left side and most armors were built up over the right because the left side was going to be the place that took most of the hits. Um, Why if you're left-handed? Then you'd probably get the armor made the other way around. But very <laughs> rarely were you left-handed in those time periods. Just be- partly because you probably would have been taught right-handed too. I was going to say, yes. Left-handed people had this association with being sinister um, and and untrustworthy in things. There was like a lot of superstitions around that. So they probably avoided it if they could. They might be ambidextrous. They might be able to play around with either side. But typically, you had the sword in the right hand or the weapon in the right hand, and then you'd have your left side um, for holding onto the reins of your horse. So on the right side, you'd have something to be able to like parry with. And on the left side, you're probably just going to have to take the hit. Um, so you'd probably build that side up a bit more. But what you're referring to by the sounds of things is what you'd call garnitures, which were essentially additions to armor that you could take on and off. Um, for modular armor modular armor so, <laughs> because again if you had a lot of money you would have your battle armor you'd have your tournament armor you'd have your ground tournament armor you'd have your jousting armor you'd have all these sort of different armors like like Batman does in his cave but if you didn't have money then you'd have your basic war armor that you needed for basic you. bitch armor yeah your, your war armor which is good fighting in on the battlefield but then if you want to go into a tournament you're going to need extra reinforcements because those lances hit hard so you might buy a garniture to screw onto the front of the armor to reinforce the shoulder or put a lance rest on to help you keep the lance up in the fight uh, in the tournament um so there's all these different sort of things that you could screw on and off oh that was another thing in the bloody um nice tale you know in the when they're doing the final jousting scene and yeah. he's got that lance mm-hmm. and he's like oh he's it's splintered, or I can't remember the terminology they used, but it was like always oh, reinforced it or something. Which made it stronger that like they were designed to splinter, as opposed or is that more recent? Or so it's backtrack and basically explain better what I just said. Yeah, so <laughs> basically lances, uh you had two types of tournaments. Uh you had the tournament of war and the tournament of peace. Tournament of war, you use proper war lances. We're talking solid lances, solid wood lances, um, which could snap and break after from those impacts, but typically, um, I mean, a lot of the time they would break, but they were not necessarily designed to break. They were designed to go through armor and through the person you're striking. So if you're in that sort of tournament- They'd be pretty pointed, would they? Yeah, they would have sharp points on them. Um, Sick. Like a Fucking spear tip. impale someone. Basically, I mean, that's how the lance worked. You had a huge force of cavalry and you would launch towards the enemy and they were one-shot wonders for the most part. You know, and you just smash them straight through the first blow you hit, like a shot cavalry hit. Um, Do you reckon there's ever been a guy impaled on the end and he's mad? I mean, you'd have to be some seriously strong, made of some strong stuff to be able to hold someone at the end. Or lift it up. Yeah, I'd be like, parading around, like, look what I fucking caught, boys. You say that, but um, what was it? Uh, The Germans, uh, there was an account where there was a particular German knight, he would actually go around and get kids to hang off the end of his lance and then he would couch it and hold it up to show off how strong he was. And you'd just like parade around the tournament arena with like kids hanging off the end of his lance and then you'd put them back. 
It was fucking mental, isn't it? <laughs> so funny. I love that. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah. Now, I doubt with the, the actual impaling of, but that's how they kind of worked. And then you got the war, of, uh, the Joust of Peace, which where the lances were made from a lighter wood designed to break. Not necessarily splinter like they do today, if you ever see a modern Joust. They, they make them out of balsa wood nowadays to sort of lessen the impact. Explode. Yeah, and really show it off. Um, but they Make were, it make it look cool. Typically, we think, again, they were designed to break into three sections. Um, so they were designed to break, take away some of the impact. They also had a different head on them called a coronel head, which was a, a flatter head with what we call um, sort of four prongs on it. So it dissipates the weight um, or the, the energy rather than it's concentrating in a single area, making it a lot safer to use. Um, but yeah, so there were two different types of jousts. And the, the joust of peace becomes more popular as too many people get killed or injured in the joust of war. <laughs> I mean, jousts started off like, I wish you'd do, a, wish you'd do an episode on jousts. I mean, we were already doing an episode on Joust. Is is there enough content to do an episode oh, so of Joust? So much. I'm already talking about so much. But Joust started off with basically knights like getting bored and being like, right, do you want to have a do you want to have a tournament? And they're like, yeah, right. And they'll just choose an area in the country, and a bunch of knights will turn up in one town, a bunch of knights will turn up in another town, and they just have a mock battle. But <laughs> so many people got injured or killed. Basically, and, what people do now. Yeah, and it? the local air people that lived around there hated it because they would be like raiding and doing all sorts of shit. And basically, they eventually had to be sort of outlawed and then formalized to give them a form of like entertainment essentially oh wow so they started off with just like full-on battles it's like, please stop doing this yeah God. Stop. yeah but we like it we're oh, bored fine all right we'll, we'll make it official we'll get an arena like we'll sort it all out just i suppose if you would if you you know back in back then in them in, in them times back in day back in day i suppose um if you were considered to be like fucking sick night like jet Li style moves yeah. You know, you'd want, you'd be like, oh, you know what, I'm, bo- I'm, I don't, I'm bored of all these battles. You know, I want to fight the other very best. Yeah, exactly. And that's what tournaments were. They were basic bragging rights. The ability to go and show off how awesome you were to people. I can imagine people. you'd get, you know, endorsement deals. You know, you'd get... I mean, if you're a lord and you're entering a, a tournament, you've probably already got an endorsement deal. In the sense that the entirety of the people that live on your land have to give you their shit for free. (laughs) (laughs) You know, David, this is why you're here. You know how it works. Because you were saying about how kings like probably paid a lot of money for their armors. And sometimes they might have, but a lot of the time they got it for free. Money makes money. That's true. Because if the king goes, I want an armor, you can't say no. Yeah. Or I guess, yeah, if you go to some guy who's really good at making it. Yeah. Like, can I Again, have, can I have one? <laughs> if you if you were like a foreign Also you'd probably want to, because yeah. if if in a fucking painting it's got your armour on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone go, like, Oh, that's sick. That's sick like, armor. I like that. Yeah, craftsmen were often hiding um, from around the world. Like they, they, so they might be a good Italian craftsman or armourer and someone over in England might pay them to come over and build their armour for them. So there's a lot of money and stuff in that in that sort of environment. Um and again, there's a lot of but fashion But it's not too dissimilar well. now. When you start thinking about it, it's like, oh, how did how did people make them? But it's not too dissimilar to now. It's, you know, why why do brands exist? Yeah. It's because lots of people like them. And exactly. They make good shit. Yeah. I mean, I think it was uh, King Francis I of France, funny enough. He actually um, paid Leonardo da Vinci to come and live in France till he died. By that point, he'd done all his good stuff. He was just like old now, old and diddery. And it he's was, drawn his cocks. Yeah, and it, and it wasn't. It wasn't on the, uh, on the ceilings. Yeah, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't a great investment on Francis's side. He's kind of. I don't think it lasted very long. I think he lived in France for like five years, ten years. Didn't really do much and died. But anyway, but yeah. So people were paying, uh, you know, craftsmen and armourers and all sorts of people to come over and support their court and support their country. Um, so yeah, being an armourer was a real big, real really good uh, investment uh, job. Sorry. But yeah. Right, I'm going to try and name all the bits of the armor again. So we've gone through helmets, haven't we? We've got Salé's Bezig. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we completely we shot. We completely uh, I forgot that's where we were. Even great at. helms. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, I hope you didn't hear that on, on well, like, the, my stomach. The grumblies. Uh, uh, so yeah, we did the helmets. Did the helmets. We did the helmets. So let's go down. So we you got did the, the chest plate as well, didn't we? Yeah, we talk about chest plate. You've got the breastplate and you've yep. got your back plate. So that covers your, your chest and your back, obviously. And then on your shoulders, you would either have... Uh, oh, God. What is it? It's the problem. I haven't done it in so long. Uh, spalders. 
which are kind of like a f- smaller uh, form, an earlier form of shoulder protection um, that you could have. Or you could have, uh, oh God, the fucking, the fucking word's got it. I can't do it clearly. It might come back to me. It might come back to me. We're Go- going with spoilers for now. Go- Google it. What is it? Shoulder protection on armor. I do know it. It's going to piss me off when you say it. I think we're going to the pauldrons. Ha ha, cocksucker. Yeah, that's not really coming up with what we want. Pauldrons. Best shoulder motorcycle armor guide. <laughs> so a larger form. Pauldron, yeah. Yeah, pauldron. So there you go, pauldron. Components of medieval armor. You know what? Okay, test me. Okay, so here we go. So the helmet or the... Salé, Bezague. Uh, yeah, yeah. Salé. And then you got your, your chin one. Chin one, Bezague. Not Bezague. Uh, Begins with a B. Bever. Bever. And then your, your shoulder. Shoulder, pauldron. Mm-hmm. And then your sort of your chest. Breastplate. Um, the sort of the elbow. Elbow bit. It's either... There's two, so there's like sort of the upper bit. So is that towards up, your up, upper cannon? No. Ooh. So it's sort of. What does it begin with? You know, in between your bicep and your tricep. Yeah. Just above the elbow. Just above the elbow. The re re brace. The re re brace. I've never heard of a re re brace. I've not heard of the re re brace. The re re brace. Typically. R e r e brace. Cool. The no to. Broadly put it into you've got your upper cannon, lower cannon. So upper cannon's like the bit of metal that covers your bicep, and lower cannon should be the bit that covers your forearm. Yeah, well you got the And then, then you've be, got the actual elbow, the elbow there. which is either I think it's cooter. Yes, you're yeah, correct. There you go. And then you got your stomach below your Well that stomach, just the stomach area, I guess. Yeah, you can't, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. It's like um it's kind of part of the skirt, isn't it? Placard. Placard. There you go. My friend. And then got your. Uh, Again, forearm. I typically call for, lower cannon, but forearm. sometimes it can be incorporated into the gauntlet as well. So that's the hand. And it's called the. The van brace. The van brace. The van. Okay, interesting. Brace. Interesting. Apparently. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's, this is all off Wikipedia. Loads, yeah, so take no. There's loads of different. Take names this stuff. with a pinch of salt. Because Sometimes you'd refer to a van brace as being the entire, if the whole arm is connected into one piece, possibly. Maybe, maybe but, that's what they're thinking then. But And then you've got your sort of your your belt area. Yeah, I don't know. If I've made... Folds. Folds. And then obviously your gauntlet, yeah. which is your hands. The, I guess the upper thigh. Upper thigh. Um, oh, is that? Oh, this is late medieval Gothic plate armor. So yeah. this is the list. So it, upper, could, it, could, it could be, be different. Yeah. Um, upper thigh is, uh, oh, is it quees? No. Queeses? 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 Yeah. C-U-I-S-S-E-S. Yeah, queeses. There you go. That's your quees. And then your knee. Pollen. Yeah. And then your shins. Sabaton? I don't know for shins. Sabaton's your feet. Yeah, sabaton's your feet. Shins. Greaves. Greaves. Fucking greaves. You did well though, David. I did all right. I did all right. It's the problem I haven't been on lockdown for nearly the entire year is I've not had to talk about history for a while. It's all kind of disappeared or faded. It clearly hasn't, David. Because I used, this, to, go, I used this to go through is, all this that. This is unscripted. Um, <laughs> we have a... Quite literally is David will literally just come in and be like, hey, we're talking about this today. And he'll just go off on it. So it clearly hasn't escaped you. <laughs> not, no, I need some prompting sometimes. But yeah. There you go. So those are all the bits of the medieval armour, in particular gothic armour by the looks of things. There's other bits and bobs that go on top of that sometimes. Oh, you used to talk about the radial dishes, weren't you? Talking about the... Yeah, what are the... Yeah, the... They're called um, bezigues. Bezigues. They're called bezigues, and they are like... A, uh, because gothic armours typically came in with much finer shoulder protection than the Italians because they wanted to save on weight, that meant that your armpit was very exposed. So they're just little discs or plates that actually just hang off the top to basically cover that area, make it harder to strike. So So just it just 
a tiny bit more protection, really. Yeah, yeah, essentially. It's just to sort of cover up another area. And that's something... I keep on going on about German armors and Italian armors, right? I should probably explain that a bit. Because basically, when you get into sort of like medieval period, you've got two main manufacturers and styles of armor. Whilst other countries had their own flair or take on it, it's been largely agreed that these are the two sort of bases of manufacture and certainly the most popular places to get your armor manufactured. And they both came down a different kind of thing. Sounds like about right now. Like yeah. For cars. For cars, yeah. <laughs> or computers or whatever it is. Um, so the Italians favored much larger, rounder um, and heavier armors because they were kind of going on the sort of principles of like the tank almost, um, you know, being just unstoppable. So you cover as much as you can in the plate. Uh, you had very big pauldrons that came quite far down to cover the armpits. Um, your breastplate was typically quite large and rounded, um, kind of bulbous looking almost. And that's because you want uh, these sort of rounder surfaces to sort of deflect weapons as they're coming in. Also, you want a little bit of, a, again, a crumple zone for the chest as well. Um, so you don't get hit and strained to the rib cage or whatever. It's going to protect you, dissipate the energy across your body. So that's their sort of style. Whilst the Germans were like, we're going to opt for faster and more maneuverability um, with less protection. And so their armors tend to come in a lot lighter um, and not as heavily protected. So there's a lot more exposed areas on the armor, um, but they are faster. They could probably last longer on the battlefield. I mean, down to what you're training, down to what you're used to. Um, and then there's plenty of armors that sit in between those as well. I was going to say, so it's the typical armor as well, like for the, especially for the breastplate, is it like a jumper? You sort of like put your hands up and you sort of like put your arms out? Or is it like, uh, is the seam obviously down the side of your body? So is, typically... Is, the, is, that, is that got like leather straps that you like Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you got it hinged. Um, so you typically over the shoulders would be leather straps, like belt straps. Um, and you would have sometimes a hinged... Uh, breastplate so it'd fold open and then fold closed um, but a lot of the time they're just two separate pieces so you'd tie them together over the shoulder and then you would have a belt strap on the sides to tighten them up you know on the side so that's how you do it and, and again in armor you didn't get dressed yourself you couldn't do it yourself you cannot put your armor on yourself you need someone else to do it and that's where your squire comes in who's your squire because david has his own piece of armor i do i have my own suit of armor yeah yeah uh whoever's What's What's... Whoever's in the room at the time. <laughs> or you. Come hither. <laughs> <laughs> you, squire. Squire. To be fair, sometimes we did that. Uh, we used to teach uh, kids and sometimes we'd get the kids to try and arm us. And, uh, and that never went well. But <laughs> What's your armour? My armour is a bang on 1500, replica, I will say, bang on 1500s. So it is a very um, northern Italian armour. So it actually has a, it, whilst it, stylistically it looks like an italian armor with the smooth round surfaces it's structurally more like a german armor it's a very light armor right um so it's very light very maneuverable but but i guess style of it i guess replicas though is i bet the metal construction now is just unreal it's shit mate is it it's shit mate really compared compared yeah you'd think it'd be better surely so most modern armors that you buy um, typically, it depends what range you're paying, obviously. You can pay a ungodly sum of money to get a fucking incredible suit of armor these days. There are people out there that can do that. But my one's mild steel, pretty much. I wouldn't go in a battle with it. Fucking drop dead. <laughs> like one hit with a hammer and I'll be... What about zombies? Out. What about a zombie? Oh, zombies. Plenty for zombies. Yeah, you ain't biting through it. Like, fuck that. Yeah. Yeah, it's good enough for zombies and that's definitely my plan. But, um... Maybe we'll, we'll do... Maybe we'll do an episode in the future of, uh... Best zombie loadouts. Best zombie loadouts. I've already got one. Sick. Yeah. Anyway. Well, obviously you'd have chainmail. Chainmail would be the way yeah. to go because I can't buy through it. No, you can't buy through it. It's good shit. No one's ripping through that hand, bare hand. As long as it's riveted, not butted. Ah, yes. But anyway, but yeah. But no, that's, that's kind of my armor. But typically, the, the thing is about the medieval period is their armor was fucking shit hot because one, they had a shit ton of disposable income and two, their lives depended on it. They lived by it. They yeah. needed it. Nowadays, it's about maybe making it aesthetically look good. Or, you know, so there are jousting tournaments and people do need legit decent armor for those tournaments. Um, and so there are craftsmen out there that can make you proper decent armor. But a lot of the tricks of the trade were lost. They didn't write it down. They just all sort of passed it on. And, uh, you know, and we're talking, and it sounds crazy because nowadays we've got like thermometers and we can tell heats and all this sort of stuff. Back then, they kind of just looked at 
the color of the flame or the way the, the the brightness of the metal as it glowed and like just were more instinctual about it but they're the the quality of some of their stuff they made and the way they put it together as well and i can't even explain it until you've actually experienced it but my replica armor is like not like it's like considered compared to a lot of the other armors uh, that my colleagues wear it's about 30 kilograms all in all that's the but then again, I guess how the average soldier now, how much do they carry on? 60 on their backs. Bloody hell, yeah. Yeah. Which is mad because that's, that's, I mean, I'm just over 11 stone. Yeah. So that's what, 72 kilograms, something like that? Yeah. 75, 72? Yeah, it's r- roughly around that. So, you know. That arm is like half of me, half of me, and you know, yeah. guys in the army are carrying just shy of ten kilograms of me. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? But like, you, when you get your hands on some original, but I guess armor, if you've just been training in it, and you just do that every day, and you just, you know, that's you it. just get used to it. Don't These you? people live by it. It was crafted to fit them like a glove. Like they, they, it doesn't get, it doesn't take long to get used to. No, it doesn't. Carrying that kind of, it doesn't. Way. Like when I first got into armor, the first thing my boss made me do was run up five flights of stairs over and over again, and I thought I was going to puke. Oh. But now, <laughs> now I get in it and it's fine. <laughs> I should go down the Geneva Convention. You yeah, should, I should have. I, should, I probably yeah. should have reported him to HR for that. <laughs> he made me run. He made me run up and down stairs in armour. I've never done it before. <laughs> I've never run in my life. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't look forward to getting back into it because that's going to be, it's going to be rough. It's going to have to learn it all over again, pretty much. Mm. But if you get yourself on some original armor, not only does it, is it incredibly light. going to get light. themselves some original armor. No, no, no. But if you ever get your chance to pick some up, like you go to a museum and they just so happen right. to be showing stuff up, like you'll be taken aback how light the stuff is and mm. how strong it is and how well put together and how smoothly it moves. Because again, that's, that's the that's art. If that's your livelihood, right? Exactly. You would, wouldn't you? Yeah. It's like coats now. Mm-hmm. Or you know, back in World War One, and it was all really thick, heavy wool. Yeah, and like horrible. Mat- Wool's a nice material, but you to go to war in that Itchy. where it's wet, horrible, heavy, heavy. Yeah, like now you got all the polyester material. You know, just nice silk materials. Exactly. And, and so I can imagine it would be the same back then. You know, you'd want to make that process better. Yeah, you do, and 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 they they make incredible. Incredible works, incredible stuff. And some of the artistry that goes into it is just absolutely mind blowing. Like just, because that's another thing is like armor was there to protect you on the battlefield, but it also a massive symbol of status. So if you want to look good, you might have an armor made for a party. You might wear an armor for a parade. For a party? Yeah. Imagine that. O2 Academy. Favourite brands playing. Ba, ba, ba. Get my party armour. Get the party armour out. <laughs> Let's let hit the town, lads. Armour up. RGB lights on it. Yep. Ba, 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 ba. No, but like you would have armours that were blued. Um, so they were kind of like a bright peacock kind of blue colour. And uh, you'd have armours that are gilded with actual gold. You'd have armours with... See, I've in- seen some of that before, to yeah. be fair. Like gold accents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you might have one with like an entire work of art on the front of it, which was acid etched into it. And acid that's basically etched. what they do is they get the breastplate and then they put, they cover it in a wax film. And then the artist will draw the image and into wax. the wax, put the and acid over just, it. Uh, that makes and then you sense. wipe the wax off and you've got this clever, war, really detailed and wonderful looking sort of patterns on these armors. Incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And it just blows your brains out when you see it. And then you've got like, um, embossed as well where they literally the craftsmen themselves are beating out these very detailed images within the metal like lion heads and 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 other sort of shapes it's absolutely insane it's insane what they managed to achieve because again i think there's a lot of more modern arrogance when it comes to like history and mm-hmm. people think oh they only had like sticks and shit how could they, they possibly they, um, make this poo, what are they gonna do which leads to people thinking that aliens fucking did it and i ain't getting started on that but um yeah but but they did. What if they did, David? Most mainstream also <laughs> historians <laughs> believe this. But one person on the internet said this. Yeah, but you can't prove them wrong, David. So Yeah, but they can't prove themselves right either. 
They can, and I can I'm, prove them wrong. We watched that video, David, and you couldn't come up with a single shred of evidence to disprove his theory. <laughs> it was a fucking gas silo. David, gas silo, smash silo. <laughs> it don't matter. It was definitely a UFO landing. And the way they presented the fact was most mainstream historians believe this to be a gas silo, but some people think it was a UFO landing pad. What the fuck is that? <laughs> that was the legit words they used in this documentary. The actual wording of it. And it made sense. Yeah. Oh, God. You couldn't disprove it. This is why I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love winding you up when it comes to it. <laughs> Until there's evidence, like actual evidence. There was. We watched it. No. No. I'm open to like being proven wrong, but no. Just no. What program was it? It was like Unsolved UFOs. Or oh, I shit. can't remember. Ancient Aliens. Ancient Alien. Oh, no, something like that. It was I brilliant. It's very entertaining. Yeah. Piece of fiction. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> but yeah. God, armors. There's so much to talk about armors. I really bit off more I can chew here. There's a lot. Like we've just covered the medieval stuff. We didn't even touch on the Japanese or the paper armor of China or the silk. Sort of like capes that are arrow proof that the Japanese cavalry use. We can come back. I'm sure. We have to come back. There's just yeah. so much to talk about. Well, medieval to, armor. Medieval armor. This will be roughly medieval armor with a few, a lot of divergence. Yeah. Uh, well, well, this this episode will be medieval armor as opposed to just armor. Sure, that works. Is that is that the right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, we covered a little bit of the Greeks and the Celts. and Yeah, the, well, we can dive off, you know. Yeah, and the Romans. And yeah, exactly. It's, it's just the beginnings of armour. Yeah. Normans, okay. I suppose. That's fine. But European armour, more or less. Um, But yeah. Well, what's the episode called? European armour? Medieval armour? What's it called, David? I don't know. It's not my department. I just come up with the topics. You come up with the names. Yeah, but this is... Right. And if you're not doing puns, I'm going to be well upset. The entire... <laughs> <laughs> the entire episode what would you categorise it as I would categorise it as European armour with a few distractions just European armour we'll call it medieval armour it sounds cooler doesn't it medieval armour it's got more or of a ring to it medieval European armour no that sounds too hoity toity this is not a hoity toity European podcast. medieval armour the, f- the armour specifically armor. found within the countries of England Germany and Italy made within the medieval period in Europe that's a too long With title, that David. A I, slight I, divergence into jousting and Greeks. That'll be the description. No, that's the title. I'm doing a Fall Out Boy style. <laughs> We're going to make really long titles, obscenely long titles. You've hit the character limit. That's all I'm saying. Oh, that's all I'm seeing when when you say that. We'll just have to upload them into separate sections so we can fit the whole title on. <laughs> part one <laughs> part one of five just th- there's no parts it's just so we can fit the title in just it. fit the title but yeah is there any other questions you have about armour like is there anything like that genuinely interests you that you can prompt me with because I've, I've kind of dried up now I feel oh, like well, I need a piss thing. so that's where I'm going first what time are we on anyways probably quite yeah, we're over an hour oh fuck yeah we'll bring it to an end then yeah, we should probably bring it to an end. Yeah, we'll bring it to an end. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a summary. We'll make a summary. Go for your wee. That was really good. That. Oh, yeah, okay. Go for your wee and we'll make a summary. At least it's right at the end. So we know how to cut. Christ, I needed that. <laughs> but yeah, so I've pretty much talked for way too long. Yeah, you have. To be honest, I was quite bored. Yep. Um, so we probably should round it up. I just next time, mate. Just if you could keep it under twenty minutes, you know what I mean. I will try my best. Um, twenty minute histories. Yeah. Twenty minute histories. There would be a second channel. Yeah, bite-sized channel. We're thinking about too much in the future. 
We haven't even, <laughs> haven't even put out the first to one. To the probably one listener that is my mum. Hi, mum. <laughs> or a friend that thought they'd drop in. Hi, friend. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you. Yeah. But no, so we'll round it up. That was kind of like a very uh, scattergun approach to armour. There's mean, so much to talk about. It's a big topic. There's going to be, if there is people listening, there's probably one person that's really pissed off right now. I think, you didn't talk about this. Send it in the comments. Let me know. Just propose yeah, it. Comment and say, David, fuck you. Fuck me. Fuck you for fuck not me. talking about... This type of armour. Yeah, Japanese army. I think quick. you'll find... You didn't talk about this transitional period. You didn't talk about the copper armors of the Babylonian people. No, I didn't. I know about them, but I just didn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> Future episodes. You know, we can't have all the all the content gone in one episode. Yeah, we? exactly. You know, where would our future episodes... There's only so much of history we could talk about. So much. But no, so thank there's you There's a for lot listening. of history we could talk about, but there's With only so... so much. It's a finite amount. There's only, there, there's only there so a, much tea. There is a limit to how much history there is in the world. Exactly. Despite how vast and broad it is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But no, so leave a comment if you liked it. Um, if you have any sort of suggestions for topics that you want to talk about, leave Please one as well. Please do, because... Um, We'd love to cover it. David would love to learn about it. I always love to learn. That's why I love, <laughs> that's why I love doing what I do, because I'm always learning. I will always love asking stupid questions. It's good shit. But yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, we will bring this to a close. Yep. And hopefully see you next time. See you in a bit. Bye. Enjoy. Bye.